We have Joseph Roche and his wife, Renuka. She goes by Ray. Um, so Roche um, is a professor um, in the Eugene Applebaum College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences um, in physical therapy. Um, and Ray is um, a professor of occupational therapy at Eastern Michigan University. And they have recently published joint research on COVID-19 and um, the healthcare industry. And they're gonna teach us tonight what they published on and some other thoughts that they have. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to them and we are really excited to hear from them. So we thank you all for joining. All right, hi, I'm Ray Roche. And I'm Joseph Roche. I go by my last name, Roche. Yeah, and you guys can call me Ray. So, All right. so the point about this session and what we're going to accomplish in this session is to give you an overview of what we learned through our COVID research. The goal is also to summarize what this has taught us and the need to reimagine healthcare. And we're going to introduce some food for thought, especially the a model which we are calling human occupation and movement based healthcare models. Um, I just want to point out that, um, you know, we have other goals in life too, in addition <laughs> to uh, educating others about uh, research and healthcare. Um, but today it's about these goals that uh, Ray just laid out. So, why are we here? Um, basically, when COVID-19 hit Detroit, uh, Ray and I decided that we are going to repurpose some of our resources and try to find answers regarding what is happening in this disease, COVID-19, and see if we can scour the literature to find answers regarding molecules, drugs that are already approved by the FDA and other regulatory bodies um, and see if those drugs that are already approved can be repurposed and used to reduce COVID-19 illness. So we um, published two papers on this, and one is really worth talking about. It is a paper that we published in a journal called the FASEB Journal. FASEB is the policy voice of experimental biology in the US and even across the world. So through this, um, publication, this FACET publication, we have actually become experts in this field. It, it sort of feels a little boastful, but it's, it's really not. We have been considered as experts in the field because we have been invited to provide peer reviews for articles um, on the subject and even uh, grant proposal reviews. Um, so it's, it's been an interesting experience and we have learned a lot out of it because we've been thrown into this ocean where we had to sink or swim. So what qualifies us? Um, as I said before, I am a clinical therapist with 22 years of experience in occupational therapy. But in this context, my experience with individuals who have had acute respiratory distress and those who have been vented and in an ICU, um, have had, I have had an opportunity to work with them. Um, my training includes uh, in pediatric neuro neurology with intense didactic and research focus in the biomedical sciences. Um, at Eastern, I teach neuroscience and OT across the lifespan. And my research topics is a very varied topic, uh, but it includes pharmacotherapy for genetic disease, particularly muscular dystrophy, and now COVID-19. Yeah, so I'm a physical therapist by training. I have worked um, with patients in intensive care units with respiratory problems. Um, I do have PhD training in rehab science with a focus on physiology. Um, I went through several years of postdoctoral training in muscle biology as well. Um, all of which equipped me to be able to kind of repurpose my research resources um, to investigate uh, COVID-19 and find answers that might be useful um, in the clinic to reduce COVID-19 complications. So that brings us to the first goal for today's educational session and discussion. And that is to give you an overview, an overview of what we have learned about COVID-19 
through the research that we've done. So in this figure, what you're seeing is um, a schematic that we presented in our FACEP journal paper. There's a lot of information here, but what I'll just tell you is that we published a hypothesis paper. Um, it is not a paper based on a large scale randomized double blind clinical trial that has to be kept in perspective because what we published was a hypothesis. And this hypothesis was developed based on earlier evidence from the original SARS disease and then the emerging evidence on uh, COVID-19. But when I put this on the screen, there's just too much. So we have to back up and give you a little bit of basic fundamental information that you could use to make sense of this. So, you know, as PTs and OTs, we, we don't go into the clinic every day saying, you know what, these are the molecular pathways for pain. These are the molecular pathways for neural plasticity. I'm going to work on these molecular pathways. We don't do that. We look at things more from an organismic point of view. Um, and therefore, molecular biology is not second nature to us. So if you looked at the schematic from our paper and said, hey, that looks like a minion, uh, we would not hold that against you. So what's up with the minion? Well, we'll get to that. But we need a little bit of background. We need to take a few steps back and talk about some basic info. How do human cells make proteins? How does the COVID-19 causing virus, SARS-CoV-2, hijack host cell protein making machinery and other functions? And why is it that some individuals are having such severe complications from COVID-19? So, I just told you we're going to talk about how cells make proteins, and you must be like, oh my goodness, you are going to start from where, you know, proteins or originate from before you talk about COVID-19. Well, I'll try to cut to the chase quickly, but this is important. The thing is, what makes us humans and even animals who we are to a large extent is protein biochemistry. Therefore, it's important. And, next slide. It is important in terms of understanding what is going on in COVID-19. So on the screen, what we have is a cell. It could be one of these host cells that gets infected by the COVID-19 virus. So what we are seeing in this cell is a nucleus where you have code, the genetic code to make stuff like proteins. So that genetic code is stored in the form of genomic DNA. That genomic DNA makes what is known as a message. And that message is known as messenger RNA, which comes out of the nucleus, binds to these gray spheres here, known as ribosomes that decorate this membranous structure known as the endoplasmic reticulum. And those ribosomes play a very important role. What those ribosomes do is that they are like jewelers. What they do is they're looking at the, the formula to make a necklace and they're saying, huh, I'm gonna take the genetic information in the form of nucleic acid information and translate that into this beautiful necklace, which basically is protein. So ribosomes play that role of taking the nucleic acid information and translating it into amino acid sequences. These amino acid sequences are what become proteins. Proteins like collagen, which make up most of our connective tissues. So what happens in COVID-19 is that this virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it invades cells, host cells, through a protein on the membrane of those host cells known as ACE2, gets into host cells, 
and uses the host cells protein making machinery to start making viral proteins and copies of itself. There is something unique about the SARS-CoV-2 virus and it is known as a positive sense single stranded RNA virus. That's, that's a lot of words there. But essentially what it means is that when this SARS-CoV-2 virus gets into a cell, it has information that is recognized by the host cell as messenger RNA. It looks so much like messenger RNA. So therefore, the viral genome can use the ribosomes straight off the bat and start making viral proteins and other structures that the cell would normally use to make and package proteins now enslaved to making viral proteins and more viral particles. And then when those viral particles are made, the cell's own packaging and shipping machinery is used to make more viral particles and package them and throw them out of the cell so that they can go infect other cells. And if they get into our secretions, they can be sneezed out, coughed out, spat out, sung out, and other people's cells can then become host cells. I say this because this is the science behind why social distancing was followed, why cloth face coverings are now recommended. So now to our model, the model that we published, the hypothesis that we published. What our hypothesis did was to use the pathway that SARS-CoV-2 uses to infect cells and try to deduce what happens downstream to that, what happens as a consequence of that. And what we found from the literature, this is literature on the original SARS virus outbreak back in 2003, all the way to this novel coronavirus disease. And we were able to, to come up with this pathway where we could say that most likely this chemical signaling pathway known as the bradykinin signaling pathway was becoming dysregulated. And the dysregulation in this pathway is leading to severe inflammation which is why some individuals are getting very sick. So then what we did is we used the lens of our pathway and then were able to identify one drug, one FDA approved drug, which could be repurposed right now to potentially block this cascade of inflammation. So what has our hypothesis paper achieved? Well, we've identified an FDA approved molecule, which means that it doesn't have to go through re regulatory approval. It's already available. It can be repurposed for COVID-19 and deployed in the clinic right now. Have there been any data collected on this? Not any published as of now, but we have heard from mm -hmm. certain sources that there have been anecdotal accounts from regions as COVID-19 spread that this drug, Ecataband, was actually showing some benefit, but it needs to be further evaluated. Um, our paper was also able to explain some of the characteristic symptoms and strange symptoms like the dry cough, loss of taste and smell, increased thirst, presence of blood clots associated with COVID-19. And we are in uh, talks with industry partners, clinicians, scientists around the world, and we are trying to move things as quickly as possible so that the pathway that we described can be used in the clinic to reduce COVID-19 morbidity and mortality. So our goal is to hopefully see this through to the point where in the clinic, patients start benefiting from pharmacotherapies um, that target this pathway. So here's a breather. Um, we have to make sure that we are learning, right, as we go along. So what is the proper name for the virus that causes COVID-19? The choices are up on the screen. This is all based on honor code. You think, you, you pick what is the best answer and then we will 
confirm if you got it right or not. So a few seconds. I'll read the question again. What is the proper name for the virus that causes COVID-19? Okay, good. So if you said choice B, SARS-CoV-2, that would be the right answer. Okay, question number two for this part. Um, which of the following statements is true regarding SARS-CoV-2? A few more, more seconds for this one because there's a lot of information up on the screen. So a few more seconds. So I made it a little easy for you guys by putting the, the right choice up front as choice A. So if you pick choice A, it is a positive sense RNA virus that acts like host cell messenger RNA. That would be right. Um, a small point here using this question. Um, sometimes people might ask, well, is this virus as serious as the HIV virus? Well, that's a tough question to answer, but one thing which we know is that the HIV virus produces DNA products that, that get incorporated into the host cell genome. That's the reason why it's difficult to get rid of the HIV virus. As far as we know, from the knowledge that has emerged mm -hmm. from the original SARS disease, from other coronaviruses, from COVID-19, there is no evidence to suggest that there are DNA products that are being made that can get incorporated into the host cell genome. So it's like a cold or a flu in that way where it comes and goes, and there's no lasting effect because it gets incorporated into the genome, which as of now is fantastic news. All right, so now let's get to goal two, mm -hmm. which is what has COVID-19 taught us in terms of the immediate and urgent need to reimagine healthcare. Am I doing this part? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So um, the first point that we would like to make is that evidence-based healthcare is not just about taking clinical evidence and faithfully following it in terms of practice guidelines. It also includes paying attention to basic preclinical and clinical evidence as it emerges at a global level. Why are we saying this? Mm -hmm. Because what we learned as we were going through the literature, scouring the literature like maniacs, is that there were articles published as early as January on COVID-19. These articles were coming out first from Asia, and then you can see this trajectory, mm -hmm. this pathway, of articles coming out from Europe as well. So from as early as January, articles have been coming out and available in the public domain, listed on PubMed for everyone to be able to see. But then it seems as though somehow we still were surprised. We still seemed blindsided by this when it hit us, possibly because healthcare right now is using evidence, clinical evidence that's generated locally rather than paying attention to all kinds of evidence that are mm -hmm. emerging at a global level. In our hypothesis paper alone, we cited 60 articles of which some of those were published as early as January, 20, uh, January 2020 from Asia. The next point that we want to make is about COVID-19 and pre-existing health conditions, because this is related to the last part of our presentation. Now, as COVID-19 hit the US, there were public health messages about this saying, you don't have to worry about COVID-19 unless you are old or you have an underlying medical condition. So people were like, okay, you know what? I'm not old. I don't have an underlying medical condition and therefore I'm not at risk. The problem with this is that actually one in three 
of our population, of the US population, has an underlying medical condition. And that underlying medical condition, which is so prevalent, is the issue of insulin resistance. This report that's up on the screen is from 2017. And this is from the CDC. What they said is that more than 100 million Americans, one in three, either has diabetes or prediabetes, basically putting one in three Americans at risk of developing severe complications from COVID-19. This is the fact. And that is unfortunate because it tells something about how our healthcare system is not focusing on overall health and wellness. This is just the same information um, reiterated, um, but essentially the emphasis is that one in three Americans is either insulin resistant already or is developing insulin resistance. And therefore we have to pay attention to promoting health and wellness because a healthier society is less susceptible to complications, whether it's an infectious disease that has become a pandemic or any other health condition for that matter, even trauma from a road traffic accident is likely to cause complications in someone who has a pre-existing medical condition such as insulin resistance. Right, another thing that we started to note is was that there was no semblance of a unified response system. And this was very striking, right? You could see that different countries had different ideologies. Um, the WHO had a different philosophy within the United States, depending upon which state you were or which region of the state you were or which medical health system you were, defined what kind of response you got, right? So geography and where the patient received care determined patient outcomes versus just overall the, the the actual system itself. Also, we started to notice that there was a loose network of self-organizing local hospitals. Like for example, if uh, my hospital system was full, they could ship the patient who's coming in and if their ICUs were full, they send them to another hospital system. And we are currently seeing this um, in some levels in California and in, in Texas. However, it's not an organized system. We also noticed that if they needed to deploy some sort of public health policy, there was no framework or structure in place. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it critically underlines the need for reimagining this um, healthcare as, as a system, right? And there is lots of literature around this need to, to revamp the healthcare system. So I read four articles, um, two in the um, New England Journal of Medicine and two in JAMA, and both, all four papers talk about the, the, like the urgent need to, to revamp the system. However, it was interesting to see the focus of their, their papers. It was mostly on the financial need of it. Um, a lot of it was based on the fact that in the United States, we are, um, our healthcare system reimbursement is based on employer um, based systems. So a lot of their, their focus seemed to be more on the monetary aspect of the healthcare system versus the healthcare system itself. And what we are starting to see, like if we, I know that my OT friends and my PT friends who are on the, on the call here today know this, right? That our healthcare system is broken, right? we don't do anything about it because it's like it's somewhat broken we can manage right but but there was no need or there was no push for it but i think this pandemic brings that to the forefront mm -hmm. and it's so it's not that oh now the humankind will never have a pandemic again this is one of many however i truly hope that we as a human race don't actually have these many deaths related to a pandemic ever again all right, wonderful, thank you. Uh, that brings us to the next quiz, which uh, is, what percentage of the US population is diabetic or pre-diabetic according to the CDC or the Centers for Disease Control? Uh, 
All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you picked 33%, about 33% choice C, you would be right because roughly one in three, one in three persons is either diabetic or pre-diabetic. I can't believe you're making them do math, but okay. <laughs> All right. Um, this is pertinent to literature on COVID-19. Uh, we talked about articles on COVID-19 being available as early as the choices are on the screen. So when did PubMed listed articles started appearing free for anyone to read uh, public domain since when did those articles start appearing? If you picked choice D, January 2020, that would be right. Since January 2020, articles have been on PubMed um, from Asia and Europe uh, talking about how COVID-19 presents and what other countries should be looking out for with warnings that it is coming. All right. So... We talked about the fact that there is an urgent need to revamp healthcare. And I know a lot, of, a lot of people who work in healthcare are on this call. And some of you are the next generation, right? The, the, our heirs to, to the system. And we are throwing out an open challenge to you. I'm looking at you, really, um, um, to, to change the way we do business. I think if we go back to business as usual after this, um, I don't know, we need to be kicked on our backside. So, um, so our goal for this part is to present a, a different kind of view, right? And we are gonna call this human occupation and movement-based healthcare outcomes model. Um, my OT and PT colleagues, um, will laugh because they know exactly what we're talking about. All right, so you see this big giant cloud, right? And if you actually carefully look at the cloud, you will see the latest and greatest healthcare buzzwords, right? Holistic practice, evidence-based practice. Of course, um, everybody says this, like it slips out of their tongue, right? Uh, Patient-centered care, personalized medicine, patient compliance. Uh, of course, because I do interprofessional education and, and I'm involved in that research too. Uh, interprofessional care, uh, breaking down silos. And of course, everybody's talking about this, the economic impact on healthcare. So people are talking about the term bending the cost curve, right? So you have lots and lots of healthcare buzzwords in the field. Mm -hmm. So it essentially tells us that healthcare is not static. Right? Healthcare, people in healthcare are innovating. They are trying to do their very best to get the next best thing. The goal of that would be to develop a healthcare system that is cost effective because the goal is to do more with less, right? And, and those of us who work in this system actually are super and acutely aware uh, because some of these things are, are some our systems within which we work and are expected to change depending upon what is the latest and greatest in healthcare, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. However, this is a, a depiction of how our current healthcare outcomes model really looks like, right? So you could, most of us practice within the Western medicine system. Um, it's just called Western medicine, mm -hmm. right? And, um, but there are other, um, tra traditional or Eastern philosophies of medicine as well, right? So you will hear the term reductionism to, to describe Western medicine, which essentially means that you reduce the symptomatology to the most um, physically visible symptoms and symptoms that can be um, intervened or treated with 
an actual evidence-based practice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So in Western medicine, you'll hear the term reductionism and essentially the philosophy is diseases caused by disease agents or disease process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And health is restored if you fix the disease, the symptoms, so, right? You alleviate or reduce the symptoms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, now you go back thousands of years and look at more of the Eastern philosophy, right? Like the Chinese traditional medicine. And some of you may be aware of some of these terms, right? Um, if there is an imbalance between the two concepts of yin and yang, um, they would believe that it would cause disease and essentially lots of herbal medications or acupuncture like systems, right? Helps to balance the two, the yin and the yang and it, it, elimination of symptoms would cause increase in health, right? right? Um, it's very similar to Ayurveda, mm -hmm. right? The Indian system of medicine, which talks about the fact that there is imbalance between uh, what they call the three doshas, which is the three, um, elemental human humors. Mm -hmm. um, if you need more information, just Google Ayurveda, you'll know what, what all those terms. But it's interesting. It talks about certain people are a certain type and you need to balance this out, uh, these three, three um, humors to maintain optimal mm -hmm. health. Mm -hmm. But ultimately everything funnels towards symptoms and symptom reduction. Yeah, So there's right? a common problem with all these existing systems. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So everything is about symptom reduction, right? The overall goal of all these medical medicine philosophies is symptom reduction, right? And then the goal is eventually though, they believe that if, if there's pain and the pain goes away, mm -hmm. you, if your quality of life will become better, your ability to move will be better, your ability to maintain independent and independence is better. And overall, if we reduce symptoms, we would have a productive life, right? right? It, that's, how, that's how most of these philosophies are. Mm -hmm. And that's what our current healthcare outcome or healthcare model really is based on. Mm -hmm. so, so what? So what is the repercussions of this, right? So symptom reduction is the explicit goal, whereas quality of life, um, ability to move or be independent or be productive in your life or be productive members of society, right, are implicit goals. Mm -hmm. They're not worked on. They're like, if we fix the symptom, you will be you will be awesome, right? So resources and public health policies essentially stop at symptom reduction, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and we would think, yeah, okay, sure. But based on the 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 evidence that Roche presented, right? One in three adults has a metabolic disorder. Okay, diabetes really. Um, how is diabetes treated? Essentially with medication, more medication, and um, they will throw in there, oh, diet and exercise might work as well, right? It, it comes. But those who are, who, who are diabetic or have experience uh, or, or family members who have diabetic know that it is a slippery slope. Once you're on the medication, you are going on more stronger drugs and more stronger drugs and more stronger drugs, right? Mm -hmm. So and this is the system right now. And, and interestingly, sometimes it's not even treating the symptoms, but it's treating numbers. Some physicians would say this. They would say, well, are we treating numbers or are we treating symptoms so or are we treating the patient? Person, yes. Right. And, and, uh, but all of this is patient-centered, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we want to challenge you and say that we need to go beyond symptom management, right? The resources need to stretch beyond symptom management. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we will explain why we think that stretching that would have actually helped in this mm -hmm. pandemic. All right. So um, occupational therapists, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Human occupation. So some of you might ask, wait, human occupation lens? How will it, what kind of an occupation would a two-year-old do, right? What job does a two-year-old do? Or as I've encountered many times in my in my career i'm retired honey so um occupation though for an occupational therapist is not a job lens it's not even vocation it's 
the things that you do to occupy your time, mm -hmm. right? So what do you do to occupy your time? It doesn't always have to be making money. You could be sleeping. <laughs> my favorite thing to okay. occupy my time with. Um, so you could be sleeping, you could be eating. All of that is occupation based, right? And we believe, and, and to do a lot of the occupations, you need movement. Again, I'm not going to say movement always means movement generated by a person, right? Like we have spinal cord injured patients who may not be able to generate uh, like walking, I'm, I'm just saying movement always doesn't equate walking. Mm -hmm. Movement could be use of adaptive tools or adaptive equipment mm -hmm. to move. Yes. So uh, just keep in mind that when we describe this, this model very, very quickly. All right. So if a person actually is in the center, truly patient centered, right? A per, uh, we believe that if healthcare actually goes beyond symptom management and every member of the healthcare team, not just OTs, not PTs, not rehab professionals, but every single person, which, what do I mean? Doctors, nurses, uh, pharmacists, everybody believe that the end goal of your intervention, right, doesn't stop with pain reduction. It begin, it stops with human occupation, with patient determined positive occupation goals, right? What do you mean by positive occupations? Because you can occupy your time with negative things like, I don't know, Netflix and chill. No, that's a good thing though. Um, well, bad, bad smoking, habits, like smoking, right. Right. Um, so you can have, occupy yourself with bad things, but if you choose a patient related, good movement and occupation based goals, you are more likely to get buy in and you are more likely to get patient compliance, all the big buzzwords that uh, that the healthcare system really talks about, right? It's a great way for, for um, healthcare professionals to collaborate and have a very, um, very positive outcome, not just for the individual, but develop a both productive, equitable, and a healthy society. How is it equitable though? The reason why it becomes an equitable thing is because regardless of your race, regardless of your age, the goal is not to reduce your symptom. The goal is to get you back to what you want to do or help you learn what you want to do. So, so the goals become explicit towards human goals versus just symptom reduction, right? Um, so in this, the lens is both the client, right, the patient, as well as the healthcare team, both for planning, prevention, treatment, uses movement, uh, positive occupations, right, with the eventual goal of developing a productive, equitable, healthy society. Um, so essentially always having that as your, your end goal, that as your prize versus just, oh, I'm going to reduce symptoms. It changes the way resources are allocated. It also will change the way public health policies are put in place. So we believe that if, um, if we had a system like this in place, right, it could have very easily allowed us to deploy some public health policies to because the goal would be like, you know, oh, it's not just to cure COVID. It would be to make sure that people go back to doing whatever they're doing, whether it's to school or to work or um, to whatever else you wanted to do, mm -hmm. right? Um, so let's very quickly, we're starting to run out of like over time. So I'm going to just give a quick brief um, case study, right? So if a a patient with post uh, post COVID sequelae. We know that they have sequelae. Thirty year old male with a has or who was an hospital delivery worker. Um, in addition, also has severe low back pain, moderate fatigue, muscle cramps, and weakness, breathing difficulty, with a mild mental fog, which we are starting to see with with patients with COVID. Um, what would do you think, Dr. Roche, would be priorities? Maybe with the ex like the current models, the existing models. Well, I think based on the existing models, um, we would try to kind of go through the symptom tree and say, well, severe low back pain is what the patient is complaining of first. So we will try to fix the severe low back pain. 
And the implicit goal is that by fixing the severe low back pain, the patient's other musculoskeletal problems associated with movement and occupation will automatically get better. Exactly, right? right? So, but in the human occupation and movement-based healthcare model, we propose and we challenge you that a, a client like this, right? You would go beyond that. The ultimate goal is to the healthcare system to follow, have struts in place, have a framework in place that if the, if the client so chooses, he returns back to work. Mm -hmm. Now, the, you will notice that when I say that, there is so much repercussions, not just for the healthcare system. Like, it ties into the, like the economic goals that we currently have as well, yes. right? So it has very big um, implications if we choose to use this reimagined lens. Okay, all right. All right, final quiz for the day. So what is the main focus of current healthcare systems? This is not just in the US, but across the world. The world. What is the main focus of current healthcare systems? All right, should we give them the answer? Yeah, I think so. All right, if you chose symptom reduction, that would be the right answer, unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's what the main focus of current healthcare systems is. We are trying to change that and say that human occupation and movement should be the primary focus of healthcare systems, not, not just rehabilitation yeah, systems, not, but yeah. healthcare systems themselves. Around the world, yeah. right? It would change policies in a big sort of way. Yeah. Okay. And do we have another question? Oh, yes, we do. Final question. Which of the health, following healthcare systems would you prefer? A symptom reduction system or a human occupation and movement outcome based healthcare system? Think well, yeah. choose wisely. <laughs> All right, so this doesn't have a right or wrong answer, but yes. we hope that we have convinced you that the current healthcare delivery system that is focused on symptom reduction is not really working very well for us and that we have to rethink how this is done and that we think a simple, effective, safe way of prioritizing what we focus on in healthcare is to use human occupation and movement as our guide for healthcare delivery systems. Mm -hmm. And I will pass on the summary, right? There's yeah. no need to summarize everything that we've talked about. And with that, I would like to thank you so very much for your attention. It's been fun sharing our passion and our opinions and our knowledge with you. And I really hope this was a useful learning experience mm -hmm. for you as well. I, Ray and I very much look forward to an exciting discussion to follow. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Roshas. That was great. Um, we just want to take some time. The Roshas are going to stay on right now and answer um, any questions that you guys have. Um, you are welcome to put them into the chat box. You can also raise your hand and um, either myself or one of my colleagues will um, click on you to be able to ask your question. Um, so I can go ahead and um, start reading some of those questions. If you have to leave us this evening, we really thank you for joining us. Um, but we can get going on some of these. Um, Marge asked, Roshas, do you have an example of one strategy that could be used with the proposed model with COVID-19 in acute care? Let me clarify the question, Marge. Are you saying that we, how would this look for a COVID-19 patient who is in acute care currently, right? I think that's probably what, yes, okay. So very much, Marge, and you know that our current system is completely broken even without COVID-19, right? They go from acute care into, like if they're A-OK, -okay, they will go home with maybe outpatient therapy, maybe, or home therapy and, if not for for a, like if they are okay and they are willing to like push through um you know they don't need anything at all but otherwise they'll go into subacute or something like that right but we know that that transition right is very 
money driven. It's like, which, even if we say as OTs or PTs and say, oh, you know, you need to improve your endurance and you need to go to acute care, uh, to like an acute rehab, they have to walk uphill to get them there. So, and these systems are all not connected. So for the proposed model, suppose it was like we, the whole world followed the model that we are proposing. Essentially, first and foremost, there would be an actual structure in place to allow a client's goal not to stop and say, okay, you seem to be stable from the hospital. We're going to now pass you on to somebody who may or may not get to you anywhere, right? So the goal would be like, no, you would get quote unquote discharged, say for example, with COVID-19, um, even if you went home, your care didn't stop till we met whatever your occupation-based goal would be. And the goal is actually set by the client in conjunction with the medical team, rather than uh, the medical team driving and telling them when they're like, okay, now you're healed. Quick, quick addition to that. Um, you know, as Ray and I were putting this presentation together, there was something which we actually discussed and concluded. You have to first have life to have quality of life. Yeah, agree. So life saving treatments actually need to be in place first. So if it's a patient who is having severe respiratory distress from COVID-19, there's no question that saving their life would be the priority first. Yes. But then there are tiers of patients. We know that there are some patients with mild respiratory symptoms who go to the ERs and actually get admitted to be under observation. Then you have people who need a little bit of oxygen therapy, and then you need some, some patients need to be vented. Um, so there are centers across the world where what they have done is they have kept patients who are having mild and moderate symptoms moving yes. mm -hmm. with therapy so that they don't get worse. They have been using movement um, for those patients to actually produce better outcomes and prevent them from getting worse. And as a PT who has worked in acute care settings, we use movement. We use movement all the time to, to prevent respiratory complications. It has been in existence for a very, very long time. Um, but again, we would like to stress the fact that we are aware that there are some situations where first, saving the life is the priority, and then you start thinking about quality of life and function. Yes, but our point is don't stop, don't stop there. there. Don't stop, don't stop there. there. Yes. Go yes. the extra distance. Yes. Only because if they did this for every patient and for every condition, eventually we would spend less and have a healthier society. So um, I hope we answered your question, Marge. That was a great question because we, that's, the, that's the idea that we were trying to get to with our case study. Fantastic. Um, the next question we have is from Barbara. She says, please connect the dots a little bit more here. How does a change in focus to movement and occupation help to develop a more cohesive healthcare system in general? That is a great question. That is a great question. So um, you're asking why, so Barbara, I'm going to, to paraphrase that a little bit, that question. So I, I believe that you're asking, um, like how does, like what, why, why do you need to do this so that you would have like quote unquote a productive and equitable or um, like a healthy society, right? Like why human occupation? Um, this is why we believe so, because currently the symptom-based management clearly focuses on reducing symptoms, but they don't go to the extra step of actually um, working on health, right? So health, absence of a disease is not being healthy. Um, that is the premise on which we are operating. See, however, if you act, so there is lots of literature around the fact that if a person actually is engaged in meaningful goals or meaningful activity, they actually have better health outcomes and health outcomes in the sense they um, are less likely to have diabetes. They are, they are more likely to have better mental health 
outcomes, they're more likely to be successful in some of their um, their goals that they set for themselves, right? So right now, though, the, the idea is we get you symptom-free, and then what happens is from there, hopefully because you don't have pain, you will be able to navigate and get to this health goal by yourself. And our point is, no, if, if the health system gets to the occupation and movement goal, the likelihood that you are going to be productive and the society is much more equitable is much more than if you, the, if you leave the client at symptom reduction and then no other support. So we believe that, that, getting, that getting the healthcare system and everybody like the doctors, nurses, social workers, um, OTs, PTs, um, anybody essentially, pharmacists, anybody who's involved with it. It's like, as a pharmacist, I would give medication, but the goal is not to just treat with medication. The goal is ultimately to be um, productive and healthy and um, Healthy and well. Hell and well. Yeah, I got distracted by your hand. Well, I had my hand up so that I can actually add to that. Um, so in terms of connecting the dots, um, I would like to, you know, say something pertinent to a healthcare delivery system that would have helped us handle COVID-19 better. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let's say we had a healthcare system wh which prioritized human occupation and movement from the time evidence started emerging on COVID-19, we would have been alert to that because it would change how people occupied their time, which includes everything from employment to play for children to education. It would have affected human occupation and human movement, and that would have been a major priority and focus. The idea of social distancing, self-quarantine, the lockdown, currently face, uh, cloth face coverings, in a way, it all affects human occupation and human movement. We were trying to get people to occupy their time differently and to move differently during this pandemic. And if the focus had always been human occupation and human movement, the way in which the education pertinent to quarantine, social distancing, other precautions that need to be in place so that we don't give host cells to this dumb virus to make more copies of itself and put itself out would have been achieved. We would have empowered people to think like healthcare providers, like healthcare professionals. We would have probably got more buy-in from people if that was the message saying, you know what, you now have to start thinking like a healthcare professional, like a surgeon who is scrubbing and going into the operating room. Yes, that's a great point. Like it has repercussions for like policies in place as well. Great, thank you. We, um, we have some cute questions. We also have one individual who is raising their hand. Um, Sharon, we're gonna unmute you and you can ask your question. I'm still working on it. Um, I'll go ahead and ask um, one of the questions that was in the chat box. We'll come back to you, Sharon. Oh, sorry. Go I just, ahead. Oh, sorry. I was saying thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, forgot to unmute myself. Um, but I'm a family nurse practitioner, but I, I teach nursing full time, but I also I work outpatient and a little bit of hospitalist group. So I love your model. Totally agree with it. Um, one of the things that I haven't heard in, in your model is nutrition because I teach nutrition and I, and that's a huge factor. And I think that's the crux of a majority of our healthcare problems. So, and of course we know obesity is a epidemic and diabetes epidemic. But one of my, one of my, my questions for you with your model, which I think is fabulous. Are you guys thinking about putting some phases in because you want to make your model um, functional? Because again, I mean, 
I think at a, at a higher level, but we're going to have people who may not be thinking at a higher level that you would be able to implement this. And um, are you thinking about implementing it in different systems? Or are you thinking of doing it more acute care or um, outpatient? And then I'll, I'll let you answer. Thank you very much for your question. Sharon, I'm going to actually do the second part. And then because you asked about nutrition, you, you opened a can of worms when it comes to to Roche here because he loves loves that aspect. But um, I do love my nutrition. <laughs> you you do. I do cook well. So, um, but um, that's a good question. What do we want to do with this model? Our first step, right? At least in my utopian head, it it's like it it becomes the way people think about healthcare and the like you know if we would change the way policies are made like who follows this this model oh how awesome that would be right so we're not there yet but our very first step would be to actually get buy in from from other members of the team right like ot's and pt's for them because it's the lens that we come from it it is a little bit easier pill to swallow so to speak but we would like um like to get buy-in from our other professionals and other colleagues and other experts. And the first step would be initially just to present this model as, as a viable way. Mm -hmm. um, and then actually put in, so right now it's, it's very much a, a philosophy. It's an esoteric sort of utopian model. So our goal actually is to, to hopefully get together a team and put together actual struts like uh, what does what does if you adopted this model what does it really look like like what it what would its repercussions be and i know that it's not easy to do and i also know from literature that there are other um other medic, med, like other practitioners who are thinking about similar ideas. Of course, they're not using the word human occupation. Um, it's clearly not OTs, but but they are talking about healthcare systems driven by patient goals. Um, so there are like-minded practitioners out there, and I'm hoping that eventually that we the first step is to to elucidate the model to make like somebody asked us before right Barbara said connect the dots so we make the dots much more connected and and actually put together a thing a, a model a system that that people can say okay yeah and then if even if it is for example adopted by a single healthcare system like not the world just a single healthcare system decides that every single member of our healthcare team comes in with this lens and implement it or it can be much more smaller, right? It could be a smaller, smaller experimentation where we put together an interdisciplinary um, team that actually uses this model to intervene and see if actually their clients or their patients have better outcomes. At least that's what I'm thinking our next steps are going to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll let him take the nutrition question. Uh, yeah, th th first of all, thank you so much for the kudos for the compliment um, regarding our model. Um, I think that's a good first step for us to hear that, you know, um, a family nurse practitioner has buy-in. So that's, that's great news. Uh, in terms of nutrition, um, I think it's a vital part of health. Um, and based on the model that we have proposed, even nutrition has to be about ultimately improving human occupation and movement. Um, you know, just based on our own personal health experiences, uh, we've seen that when we go, go in for our annual physical, you know, if the BMI is slightly on the high side, let's say, uh, you need to think about weight loss strategies. But if we could change the language associated with that from weight loss towards what are yes. your movement goals or performance, or performance goals. goals? How, how I, how is this changing your experience with functioning? And then mm -hmm. you come in at this with um, a goal oriented approach. And those goals are not to reduce um, what Wait. the weighing scale is showing. It is not to just reduce your A1C levels, but it is about, 
ultimately <laughs> moving better. And I, I freely or share do. this with, with, my, with my students. And I tell them, we have to always use performance as our yardstick for how well our diet program, our exercise program, whatever, spiritual nourishment program, whatever, to gauge whether it's working or not, we need to gauge it based on human performance rather than on numbers like how much we weigh and body mass index and A1C and those kinds of things. So I think that's, that's what we would like to see in terms of using the ultimate goal of better human occupation, better human movement experience as the way we guide everything else uh, that gets us towards that goal. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. Um, we just have time for a couple more. Um, there, Gina had a couple questions. Um, she said one of them was, there's a Rehab Without Walls program who try to help people reach their occupational goals. How is this different? And um, we have seen that the COVID-19 affects the Black community at a greater proportion. Do you think there's a genetic component or because they're pre-diabetic? That's a great question. And you want to take the genetic question? Sure. Um, so in our paper that we published in the FASIP journal, we actually explained possibly why uh, persons of African descent might be susceptible to complications um, based on dysregulated bradykinin signaling. Uh, there is some evidence that there, is, that there are some genetic variations um, that are seen mostly in persons of African heritage. And this is whether it's African uh, American or uh, Afro-Caribbean, um, those of African descent who are in Europe. Um, th there are some common genetic variants that might be causing dis dysregulation in the bradykinin signaling pathway, uh, more so in them than others. Yes, and there are um, certain groups that are starting to look at those particular genetic variations in the context of COVID-19 and susceptibility to it, right? And Gina's second question is, how is Rehab Without Walls different from the current models, right? Um, I would say that it is a, it, it is a philosophy. So it, the, the idea is it's, it's taking Rehab Without Walls to, to the next level. Essentially, what do we mean? It means that it, it's, you use this philosophy for people beyond rehab issues, right? The traditional rehab issues. So we think of like spinal cord injury or autism or um, stroke, and we think of them having, having occupation-based goals or movement-based goals. And the, the goal is to get them as independent as possible and improving their quality of life. We are proposing that we take this to every condition that ever was, right? Even if it is, um, I don't know, skin disease, for example, like you wouldn't think that you would think about quality of life and, and, and um, um, occupation-based goals for somebody with skin disease. But our, our, our hope is, our point is that it's a lens that changes. And it's not just in the rehab community, but globally across um, all medical professionals. And we, we are hoping that actually in our model, we, 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 we debated this a lot, and we are hoping that actually clients themselves have that viewpoint. It's like, I am going to the doctor not because I want to get rid of a symptom. I am going to the doctor because I want to have human occupation-based goals or movement goals that we could, we could address so that I improve quality of life. But that's a great question though. Thank you. Um, and Daryl asked how, forgive me if I pronounce this wrong, how is cytokine storm involved in the COVID-19 response? Yes, that's a great question. Should I take it? Mm -hmm. So cytokines basically are chemical signaling molecules um, and inflammation uses these chemical signaling molecules um, to basically either increase inflammation or to decrease inflammation. Um, what we did through our hypothesis paper is suggest that a particular 
bradykinin derivative called desarg9 bradykinin, it it goes up, it, mm -hmm. it increases. There is direct evidence that this increases with uh, SARS coronavirus infection. So when desarg9 bradykinin levels go up, what happens is it stimulates what is known as the bradykinin 1 yeah. receptor. Mm -hmm. That triggers inflammatory cytokine signaling. So we think the domino that triggers mm -hmm. the cytokine storm actually is desarg9 bradykinin. So if you were to block desarg9 bradykinin production or desarg9 bradykinin from binding to the B1 receptor, you could effectively block the cytokine storm that is downstream to it. Thank you. That's great. Um, Reggie and David said, can you speak to the literature on the impact of stress on inflammation and COVID and how engagement in occupation in early stages of recovery impacts outcome? Okay, I'm going to defer to my talented partner here because she has actually worked in mental health settings. I have not worked directly in a mental health setting, so I'll defer to her. All right, it is a very, um... Um, interesting question, right? The goal is based on our, I, again, I'll, re -para I'll paraphrase and um, Jacqueline, if I am not saying, like actually addressing it correctly, please let me know. Um, but um, I think they're asking for the link for between stress, stress and, and inflammation, inflammation and how human occupation might mediate that. Uh, I need a clarification more on like inflammation where? like lung inflammation? I think just overall. Overall, system, okay, systematic, and we, we'll go with that, right? So again, if the, if, again, uh, from our model lens, right, if we believe that human occupation and movement was the end goal, essentially the medical care system wouldn't just focus on um, treating, so if we, if we are thinking that it's lung inflammation, right, we're not just, okay, treating, the disease and saying, okay, now you don't have any inflammation, um, peace be to you. And, and that's it, you're done, right? We, we are starting to see as part of the COVID-19 sequelae that there are other um, both cognitive, um, uh, cognitive sequelae that are involved as well as mental health sequelae. Again, are there a lot of people? We don't know because there's not enough numbers to, to suggest here or there, but there are a lot of anecdotal evidences, evidence around that. So we would, be, we would believe that if um, the system was set up to look at human occupation as an end goal, right? The entire team's goal would be not only to actually address the inflammation, but also have struts in place to address stress around, again, I'm, I'm guessing that the stress is related to- um, I think general emotional stress. Yeah, it's just, it's, yeah, it's versus cellular stress, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's like if you have stress in place, there are already systems in place there to support you through that. And, and like the medical team takes you from your acute COVID stage early on all the way to complete um, occupational performance to whatever goals that you choose to do. That would be, that would be the struts in place. Now, what do I mean by this? Like, for example, uh, when the, when, when the mental health act went into, to, to, to being in the 1940s, they said, okay, we're going to get rid of all uh, people who, who require institutionalization, right? And they got rid of it. However, it was interesting. They got rid of it. They sort of put some monies towards it, but they never built an infrastructure to support people with mental health diseases and say, okay, wh what are we as a society? So we're not going to institutionalize them. We are going to have some loose structure there and we are going to focus on symptom reduction, but we know that it doesn't work that way. You need constant support and you need constant struts in place to actually be functional and have long-term outcomes. 
Um, so I think our, our, from our model stand or viewpoint or lens, it would be like you don't stop at just um, saying, okay, very good that your, your inflammation is now healed and you're somewhat better and go home. It would be like, okay, what are, how are you doing? What next can we do with the eventual goal that you did well? And the patient would know that if they are not doing well or not meeting those goals, they could seek back help for, for that condition. Great, thank you guys. Um, in your opinion, would, uh, this is from Barbara. In your opinion, would a single payer, say improved Medicare for all or something similar, help to develop a more cohesive healthcare system? Um, that question tends to have certain political bearings. Um, and we decided that we're going to be careful about political bearings of questions, but we will veer away from the, the political aspect of it and what we would say is that based on what COVID-19 has taught us, there absolutely has to be a unified federal health care policy in place. How that looks is open for debate, um, but there has to be a federal unified health care, public health policy in place which proactively yes. has plans for eventualities, um, whether it's preventative health care or remedial health care or improved health and wellness, mental health. There has to be a plan in place for health, public health overall, because without a plan, um, basically each one is left you know, to fend for themselves in terms of figuring out what to do. And we as healthcare professionals ourselves have sometimes found ourselves um, you know, in, at, a, at a loss for what we could do to, uh, to optimize our own health. Um, so I, I, I think instead of answering that question directly, we would say that there needs to be an overarching healthcare policy in place for all kinds of eventualities and as they are putting such a system in place, we would love to see them use human occupation and movement as the guiding principle, as the guiding priority for yes. it. Yes. Fantastic. Okay, thank you guys so much for joining. We thank all the participants for joining. Um, I wanna thank my, my colleagues on the back end, my colleagues at EMU, um, this was a joint effort. We really appreciate everyone coming together. Um, Roches, if you have any last words to say before we close for the evening. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Um, what I would like to conclude uh, with is this saying that knowledge is power. Um, we as healthcare professionals have to constantly update our knowledge, be humble about the fact that we can never know everything and therefore we have to constantly seek new knowledge so that we are as close as possible to the truth. Also, I'd like to share a word of advice to OT and PT professionals as well as students. And this is based on the knowledge is power philosophy. If someone tells you that as an OT or PT, you needn't really know that. You don't really have to know that. Don't think that they're being considerate. Think that they're being condescending. Our scope of practice has finite boundaries and limits. Our scope of knowledge has no boundaries. We have to expand our scope of knowledge relentlessly so that we are respected by our fellow healthcare professionals so that we can enforce change. We have to want to be at the core of the decision-making of healthcare systems. And we can achieve that only if we expand our knowledge. I agree.
Uh, anything you would like to add? <laughs> no, I second that. I think my students may have heard the scope of knowledge versus scope of, <laughs> scope of practice uh, distinction, which is really true. There is no boundary to how much you can know. Yes, you may not be able to implement based on your licensing boundaries, but the knowledge that you can bring to your team and the change that you can affect is great. We have the advantage of an alternate lens and we need to actually use it to think alternatively and at this time at this pandemic level i think we, it, there could be no other better time um to deploy to deploy our alternate lens that's yeah. what i think and it's, and it's not just about us increasing our own knowledge we have to increase our, our own knowledge so that we can empower our clients yes. and society by transferring all the knowledge that we have to our clients and society so that they are empowered to make good informed clinical decisions regarding their own health for themselves. Great, you guys. Thank you so much. I know I'm going to remember, I don't come from a science background. I'm going to remember the minion, <laughs> the cell. And, but this is really great. I know um, we're getting a lot of great feedback. People really appreciated you taking the time to share um, your wisdom and your knowledge with all of us. Um, thank you all for coming and stay safe out there. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah.